We're talking about corporations, their formation, and their financing today. And as you can tell, I've got a kind of a different setup here today because the computer is just not functioning. It dies. Uh, I believe it's the hard drive. Because it won't boot. So it's got to be hard. I mean, you look like you were supposed to go out a few years ago, but no. <laughs> yeah, it's old. It's old. They've, they've been here. They've been here since. I already know they've been here. Twenty ten. Twenty ten. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. But no, no, no. Absolutely. In, in, in this, in this environment, they have a tough, you know, tough way to go. Okay, so let's talk about corporations, and formations, and financing. What are some of the characteristics of corporations? Well, first of all, they are a legal entity. When we set them up, we set them up so that they are persons and they have rights as persons and citizens and are they a per person the way we are persons no we are called natural persons but they are persons of law under state law and every corporation is a state entity okay there are limited liability to the shareholders it's another word there Characteristics. That means that if something happens and the corporation takes a hit, it goes bad, it starts to decline, then the shareholders only, only lose the value of their stock. That's it. They can't come after their houses or their cars or their accumulated personal wealth. It just doesn't happen. It can't happen by law. There are unrestricted transferability with their shares of stock. So when somebody buys stock, and I own a share of stock, and El Paso wants a share of stock, I can freely sell my stock to El Paso without anybody getting in the way. I just do it because we want to make that transfer. Okay? Corporations, unlike natural persons, have a perpetual existence. They're going to go on forever. So, uh, let's see, uh, corporation here in town would be uh, AT&T. AT&T will go on forever. We won't. At least I don't think we will, most of us. I'll pass them right. Anyway, they also have what we call centralized management. And centralized management is a style of management where they have officers who run the day-to-day -day business of the corporation. But then they have right above them, they have, have a board of trustees that takes care of what goes on in the corporation. Now, Fisk is a corporation. Fisk is incorporated as a nonprofit corporation. So we have a board of trust. That board of trust has the same responsibility as a large corporation for its business. Okay? Then there's corporate taxation, and corporate taxation is kind of a funny thing. I do not expect anyone to laugh at this because I certainly don't. Corporate taxation is double taxation. Double taxation. The corporation, being a person, gets taxed for its income. So all of the income that comes in to that corporation, offset by what it has to spend to make its products and what losses there are insofar as stock goes, or their investments. Now, now you, you do know that Corporations will buy stock itself. They buy stock in other companies. So they'll have losses in stock too, just like we will as individuals. All persons can buy stock. So corporate taxation takes the profits and says, okay, this is what you have after all of these deductions for losses and manufacturing and how much it costs to do your thing. And they tax that. Well, 
after they're done taxing that at the corporate level, what does the corporation do? What do they do for us? We buy stocks, so they pay us. Oh, come on. Professor Cambronero drilled this into your head. Okay. Any questions? Corporations have stockholders. When a stockholder buys a share of stock, they expect something back from it. We call that dividends. Very good. Excellent. I was waiting for that. So what kind of corporate powers exist in a corporation? Well, they have express powers and they have implied powers. Okay? Express powers for perpetual existence. Express powers for the right to litigate. They have a right to make contracts between themselves and individuals or themselves and other corporations. They have the right to borrow or loan money. And what do we call the instruments when a corporation borrows money? It's an instrument, it's an investment instrument. It's not stock, it's bonds. Good. So, Along with that goes the right to make charitable donations, which they can use just like we do as tax deductions. And they can establish their own rules for managing and operating their corporation. Their implied powers under Section 7 of the Uniform Corporations Act says, we can take whatever actions we deem are necessary and are lawful to execute the express powers that I just mentioned. <clears throat> and then there's something we call an ultra vires act. An ultra vires act. Well, let's look at a corporation as a government. The government, and we'll go through this, it has its own constitution, it has its own statutory law, it has its own rules and regulations. So when they commit say, a felony or a misdemeanor against themselves, that is under their constitution, their statute law, or their rules and regulations, we don't call it a crime. We call it an ultra vires act. And an ultra vires act is a corporate action that goes beyond the scope of the corporation's powers. It's something that it doesn't have the authority to do. And they have to then go to court, and this is a funny part, they have to sue themselves. How does that work? Okay, so let's say a shareholder believes that the corporation undervalued its stock, which means that the shareholders don't get as much dividend income as they should undervalued the stock. So the shareholders say, we're going to sue you, Mr. Corporation, for the true value of that. And they bring in all their evidence, the corporation brings all of its evidence in to court, an actual court, a state court. Some states have actual corporate courts where what they do is decide things like this. Tennessee has a corporate court. All the corporations go into this court and they're suing themselves, essentially, because it's the stockholders suing their own company, right? So they sue their own company and the court makes a decision. If the corporation loses and they say, yeah, you know, you undervalued your stock, then the corporation has to take money from, say, retained profits they were going to invest into the business and add it to the value of the stock. It's essentially an accounting change because no money exchanges hands. And it's the corporation who gets the value of whatever it was that the corporation was sued for by the shareholders. Now who pays for the shareholders to do that suit? 
corporation. Everybody is paid within the corporation framework to do that kind of work. So there are uh, law firms that are retained by the corporation to defend, and there are law firms that are retained by the corporation to prosecute. And they go in and they do it. It's very professional, very well done. And these courts are specialists in this. And they find that the value of the corporation may change as a result. What kind of corporations do we have? Well, we have public-private corporations. A public, we call it public one corporation, is traded on stock exchanges. So when you go in and you want to buy 50 shares of Apple stock, that Apple stock is a stock that you purchase and as it is on a public exchange you can own it. Any member of the public can be an owner of Apple. Okay. Public too is a government-owned corporation like Fannie Mae or Sally Mae. You heard of those guys? Or even the US Postal Service. Those are government-owned corporations and they have funds that they generate just like any other corporation. So public one is publicly traded stock, usually on stock exchanges. Public two is a government-owned corporation, and it really doesn't have stockholders, but all of us as citizens who pay taxes are shareholders of these corporations. Also those who pay their mortgages or their student loans, Fannie Mae and Sally Mae, are also shareholders in the corporation they're paying the money in for their, their debt. Then we have classifications of corporations we call domestic, foreign, and alien. What is a domestic corporation? Want to guess? Home. Home. And how home are we talking about? <clears throat> You said United States. Break it down even smaller. Within a state. Within a state. That's right. Very good, John. A domestic corporation is a corporation that is operating within the state of its own incorporation. So if I incorporate in the state of New York, my domestic location is New York. So I am a domestic corporation in New York. What if I decide I am going to operate in New Jersey as well as New York? And I go to New Jersey and I set up my business in New Jersey. What kind of a corporation am I? Domestic. Domestic foreign or alien? In New Jersey. In New Jersey. That would be foreign. That would be foreign. That's right, John. A company that operates in states other than its state of incorporation is a foreign corporation. Now, what's an alien? Different country. That's right, Stevie. If I have a corporation that is incorporated in the state of New York, and I go to England and I set up a subsidiary, and I'm manufacturing in England, or in France, or Italy, or Germany, all of those subsidiaries for us are foreign to those countries. Likewise, let's say a corporation comes down from Canada and wants to operate in the United States. There are two ways that we can tell that these corporations are a foreign corporation from Canada. You know what they are? First of all, we use INC for an incorporation at 
the end of our, our name, don't we? Mm -hmm. That's how we tell it's incorporated. From Canada, they use LTD or limited. So when you go to the store and you buy a chocolate product, and it is a chocolate product from Canada, it will say manufactured by such and such chocolate company limited. So we know it's from outside the United States. That is an alien corporation. Canada corporations in the United States, Mexican corporations in the United States, British corporations in the United States are all alien corporations. There's another way we can tell that it's a Canadian corporation. Do you know what that is? They use that on their URLs on their websites, yes. CN. Well, CA. Does anybody know what it is? No. Their clerks are very polite and they all say A. <laughs> That's right, eh? You want some more of this product, right, eh? That's, and they're all very polite. I actually, I set that up. <laughs> Not very well, but I set it up. Okay, so, publicly held or closely held corporations are two kinds of different corporations, although they're both corporations. A publicly held corporation differs from a closely held in that it has an unlimited number of shareholders. Okay? Unlimited number of shareholders. Closely held has less than 100, but more than 50. And then we have another kind of corporation called an S Corp. An S Corp is a small business corporation, so they gave it subchapter S so we could remember it's small business. It's closely held and has less than 100 shareholders. It's most frequently found to be a family corporation. And families will set it up. And the reason they set it up is a very simple one. A corporation avoids liability, right? In all things except the amount of money that can be lost by the investor. They can't take any personal property. So when families want to set up a business that might be a little risky, like you have a self-service gasoline station with a mini mart. Now that could be risky because of the environmental laws. If one of the tanks leaks gasoline, that whole area has to be dug up and it can be contaminated and that get very expensive. And people can sue them if their property is contaminated. So what they do is they say, okay, we'll establish a subchapter S corporation that keeps all of our families safe and all of their assets safe. But we may have to reimburse that individual who's suing us up to the value of the corporation itself. Then we have another one, it's called a professional corporation. Professional corporations are exactly what they sound like. We have doctors, lawyers, veterinarians, uh, barbers, all sorts of people get together and form a professional corporation. It's more like a partnership because they have shares in that professional corporation. It's like being a shareholder, but it's closed to the outside world. Not everybody can buy into that. For example, if I as a lawyer get together with other lawyers and we form a professional corporation so that we can have our own law firm, if somebody comes in and wants to buy a share of that law firm, they have to be a lawyer licensed by the state they're in, okay? You can't have, and we'll refer to them as civilians, can't come into the law firm and try and buy a partnership in the law firm. It just goes, it's just not allowed. 
And that's by state law. That's by state law. And it doesn't differ that much in various states at all. Public versus private corporations. What's a public corporation? Well, it's a corporation created by the government to administer law, and it has specific government duties to fulfill. Yeah? Is that when like, the, um, a, a company goes public at the same time? Uh, no, uh, this could be confusing because we had public one and public two. Public one was a uh, ownership by shareholders and traded across an exchange or traded openly among individuals. A public corporation is a corporation which is a pub is being referred to as public two on the last couple of slides. Public two is a corporation that was created by the government like Fannie Mae or Sally Mae in order to make loans to individuals. And they have specific governmental duties that they have to perform. That is, make loans to individuals and collect those loans under law that's been set up by the Congress. And so it's incorporated, but essentially it's incorporated by the federal government. Okay. The private companies that trade stock among their shareholders and they can go in and buy it in an exchange, they're not governed by the federal government insofar as being having their corporation registered with the federal government. No, it's individual states you set up. And we'll talk about how we set up a corporation here in a minute or two. But you don't have to register it with the government except for internal revenue services and stock purposes. Everything else is regulated by the state. So a public corporation is one that's set up by the government at whatever level. And the, another example is the Federal Depository Insurance Corporation. You ever heard of that? Well, when you put money into a bank account, it's insured up to $220,000. And it's this corporation, Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, that sells bonds, government bonds, so that they can insure all of those deposits. Okay? Now, a private corporation is completely private. It's created for private purposes. All of these formerly public one corporations that were selling stock out in the world and we were able to hold shares of their stock, but they bought it back and they're holding it and they're administering it themselves and they are self-owned. That is a private corporation held for private purposes. Okay, make sense to you? Now we also have for-profit versus non-profit corporations. For-profit corporation does what? It does business for profit. That's what they do. They're in business. If they don't make a profit, their shareholders are going to be so mad. Right? So what is a not-for-profit corporation? It doesn't sell stock to the public. That's right. Now, do, does the public have an interest in that corporation? How does the corporation fund itself? It does money Donations. Yeah. Exactly. Fundraising. What was that? Fundraising. Fundraising. Yeah. It does have shareholders, but there are different kind of shareholders. They're what we call stakeholders. They have an interest in the outcomes of the nonprofit corporation. So they don't issue stock. They don't have shareholders. They reinvest whatever money they manage to make. Say they get investors that give them money and donate money. And they have extra money. They can put it into stocks and bonds so that they can increase the amount of value of the nonprofit corporation. But they don't distribute any of that to their stake 
Okay. Domestic corporations, again, do business within a specific state where they are incorporated. The foreign corporation does business in states other than the state of incorporation. And the alien corporation does business in other countries. And other countries do business in our country as an alien corporation. Publicly held corporations, again, stocks available to the public. Closely held, close, family privately held, whatever you want to call it, generally doesn't offer stock to the public. Now, I have to put a but on that. Sometimes individuals, in order to help keep a business going, knowing that it's having difficulties, will offer to buy a share of stock or two, or a thousand or two thousand, in that business to keep it going. Now, they may not be part of the family, they're from the outside, but they have some sort of an interest in it. Um, family held corporations generally don't go outside the family. All the shares are held in the family. Um, privately held corporations, they will buy back their stock and administer it themselves. So uh, think of it this way. Would you, as an outsider, want to buy shares of stock in a corporation that's only made up by members of my family? Thank you for that vote of confidence. No, but most people don't want to get involved with other people's family matters. And that's what can happen if you buy shares in a family corporation. So we say it's best to just have that family corporation held within itself, right? The Subchapter S Corporation. It's named after Subchapter S of the Internal Revenue Service Code. What it does is it's a particular kind of closely held corporation which has generally no more than 75 stockholders. We can refer to them as shareholders because it's very much like a professional corporation where there are shares rather than stocks. Okay. Combines the advantage of limited liability and single taxation. So it is a true corporation it is registered with the state as a true corporation. The Internal Revenue Service has given it an operating number, a tax number, which says that it is a taxable corporation. However, a subchapter S corporation is treated as a general partnership for purposes of distributing profit and wealth within the corporation. Shareholders at the end of a year, receive the same kind of monetary benefits as partners in a general partnership. In other words, it's just flowed through. $100,000 comes in in profits. There's 100 people in, in the closely held corporation or a family corporation. Each family member gets $100. If there are losses of $100, Per family that flows through just like that too and those two a profit and a loss offsets itself on a family's personal income tax return so how do we set up and form a corporation well we have these guys we call promoters and promoters are going to do all the legwork to start things up what they're going to do is they're going to start organizing all of the paperwork that they need. So they're going to get start getting the charter together. They're going to start getting subscribers who are what we call stockholders under another name. But when we're just starting the corporation, people subscribe to get stock. subscribe to get stock just like taking magazine subscriptions okay 
So the promoters organize the paperwork. They get people to subscribe to their stock. Now the people aren't aren't going to be stockholders yet. They give the money to the promoter. That means the promoter has the money to work with to set the corporation up. But they're not stockholders yet. They have no standing in the corporation just yet. And then the promoter also selects the state of incorporation. There are some states in which it is better to incorporate than others that have more favorable incorporation laws. Okay? Generally, it's states that have their own corporate courts because they tend to understand their corporations much better than other states that don't have that kind of a setup. So when we're looking, when the promoter's out there looking for all of the good states to incorporate, to make their domestic home, they start asking questions like, how much flexibility is the state going to give to corporate management? Are they going to leave them alone or are they going to try and micromanage them? And they look at the state statutes in order to determine that and the rules of their trade organizations. What rights do state statutes give to shareholders? What restrictions does the state place on the distribution of dividends? Do they have to withhold taxes or can they just pay the dividends and make it the responsibility of the, the shareholder to pay that and account for that? That can be quite burdensome because the, the federal government already requires a report to go to the Internal Revenue Service by a computer every year to say what stockholder's social security number is being attributed with so many dollars in dividends. So how, if they put a lot of other restrictions on the shareholders, they don't, they don't like that because it costs them more money. Does the state offer protection against takeovers? Sometimes the state will protect their small corporations or even their big corporations, if they're vital to their economy, give them protections where individuals can't come in and just take over a business. And I'm going to talk about some of those special protections later. They're very, very colorful in name, and I enjoy talking about them. So what's exactly the legal process that we have when we incorporate? The first thing we're going to do is select a name. Acme Corporation. How many of you are familiar with the Acme Corporation? What do they sell? Just about anything, right? Anything they can get that stupid coyote to buy on the Roadrunner and Coyote cartoons. Acme, and if it explodes, it's probably Acme. I think that must be their, their, their corporate slogan. If it explodes, it's Acme. So they select a corporate name, they selected Acme. Now they have to draft and file the Articles of Incorporation. The Articles of Incorporation are like the Constitution for that business. The most important articles are the ones that talk about how they're set up, who their boards of directors are going to be, how they're made up, how they're going to treat their shareholders, what they're going to do, uh, when they have um, conflict, how are they going to handle it, what rights the various stockholders have, and that sort of thing. So they're going to draft and file the Articles of Incorporation. So we're still at the level of the promoter. They're going to do that. Then the promoters are going to call all of the subscribers together and say, we are going to hold our first stockholders meeting. And all of those individuals who the promoters have had the opportunity to sell shares and subscriptions to now find themselves as stockholders. 
with a say in the management of the business. So the subscriptions are converted to shares of stock by action of the body of shareholders who vote. Then they vote for directors and then the directors elect their officers. That's all at the first organizational meeting. So the process is we get our corporate name, we draft and file the articles of incorporation, we have our first organizational meeting. Let's not forget filing with the Internal Revenue Service for our organizational tax number, our tax ID. Sometimes, however, we just don't get it right, and we have corporations that are called defective. So when we have a defective incorporation, we end up having things like a de jure corporation. It's a lawful corporation. It's met the substantial elements of the incorporation process. It's done what it's supposed to do, but it isn't quite a corporation yet. What happens? Well, with a de jure corporation, it can operate as a corporation, but it has to take care of those things that it didn't do right the first time. It has to cure them, as we, we say in the law. It has to be cured. Then we have a de facto corporation. The de facto corporation hasn't met the requirements of the state incorporation statutes, but the courts will look at it and say, yeah, you're a corporation because we want to, un uh, to avoid what is unfairly happening to the people who thought you were a corporation. So we'll say that you are. So if there's a third party that reasonably believes it was properly incorporated, the courts are going to say, yeah, you're a corporation, you're going to work as a corporation. Then we have that word that we keep coming up with all the time, uh, estoppel. Remember what estoppel is? Okay, in this case, corporation by estoppel is when there's some folks acting like they have a corporation. And if they don't continue to act like they have a corporation, it's going to cause a disadvantage to the general public and to the people who thought they were stockholders. So the court will say, you can't deny that you're a corporation because if you do, it would be unfair to your stockholders. But finally, we have something called piercing the corporate veil. Courts love to do this. When assigning liability, especially liability in monetary terms, piercing the corporation veil will say, well, you guys are uh, supposedly a corporation, but you're acting like a partnership. So guess what? We're going to declare that you are a partnership. And since you've done something that is either tortious or criminal conduct, you are now a general partnership. And what happens in a general partnership when somebody is held liable for something? They can lose everything. That's absolutely right. They lose everything. So courts will pierce that corporate veil and turn stockholders into partners whenever they need to, to make sure that somebody is not disadvantaged or wrong. Does that mean um, Sometimes it doesn't matter how many stockholders you have. Yeah. Uh, but there was a, a situation that I knew of years ago where there was an individual who had um, an airline transport company and he had his own airplane and he flew the airplane and he called himself a corporation but he was the only stockholder now that could be real dangerous have one person who's a stockholder 
Yes, you can. Can you be an only stockholder? Yes, you can be an only stockholder. They will call it a private corporation. And if something happens where there is liability that occurs, they'll pierce the corporate veil and you become liable just as if you were a sole proprietor. It's just one person. More than one person, it would be like they were general partners. Corporations finance themselves in a couple of different ways. We have debt securities and we have equity securities. Debt securities are bonds. And bonds, as you will learn as you go through your financial education here at Fisk in business, debt securities or bonds ask people to loan them certain amounts of money. For those certain amounts of money, they are required to pay back to that person, at least annual, a certain rate of interest that enticed the individual to come in and buy that bond in the first place. It resembles a loan from a bank. And they can get loans from banks too, but they finance their own bonds. They, they say we're selling a bond issue. And all sorts of corporations do that. Cities do it. Governments do it. They sell bonds. And they pay back the individuals for that at a certain specified rate of interest. Now, bonds only last for a certain period of time, say five years or 10 years. If we have held our bond for the entire five years or 10 years, what ends up happening is that we get all our money back that we loaned them, plus all of that interest. So we earn interest at a steady rate, and we have gotten our principal back, principal being the amount of money that we initially invested. Bonds are often a good way for people to save for retirement when they reach a certain age. When we're young, stocks, because stocks are what we call risky and volatile. And they're risky because you can lose the value of that stock if the company goes bad. But bondholders, if the company goes bad, they get paid back first because they are a creditor of that company. So they get their money back first plus any interest and then all the way down to equity holders, stockholders, and they can lose the value of their stock. But it's very rare that the bondholder will lose the entire value of their bond if a company goes under. So we have bonds and we have stock, and equity securities are stock. Equity securities and stocks give a management share. We have a say in the management of the corporation. So when we were talking about bonds, I, that was just a very general description. There are different kinds of bonds. You have unsecured bonds. Normally a bond will have some sort of an asset which secures the value of the bond, a piece of equipment, real estate, uh, other securities owned by the corporation, all kinds of things like that. But where it doesn't have that, we have what we call an unsecured bond. As a general rule, bonds which are issued unsecured have a higher rate of interest. A secured bond then is tied to certain property, be it a big machine or whether it's a uh, building or other real estate or other stocks and bonds. It supports the corporation's obligation to repay it. So if they default on that bond, the corporation then has to sell those equities or that real estate or that machine to pay back its bondholders. We also have something we call an income bond. An income bond is where a corporation pays interest on the bond in proportion to the amount of earnings it receives as profit. So if its profit is 10%, then that's how much the, uh, the interest is that the bondholder receives 
on an annual basis, 10% of the value of what they gave the company to use and invest. A convertible bond is a bond which allows shareholders to convert their bond into shares of common stock. Would it be smart? It would depend. It depends on whether or not the individual who's holding the bond is more interested in being a part of management or is more interested in being a part of a community which is just holding debt. Now, if I'm holding a bond, let's say I inherit a bond through a will. I inherit a bond and I look at the company and it's a good company and I see the value of that company is growing and it's a convertible bond, I might take that bond because I'm very young. I might take that bond and turn it into shares of common stock, collect the dividends, but watch that grow until I can share it and make more of a profit. But you wouldn't change it once, like you change it once. You change it once. Convertible bond can only be changed to stock and it can only be changed once. Okay? Then we have callable bonds. Callable bonds are another kind of bond which every few years, every few years the company says, well, we're going to liquidate some of our bonds. We've done well enough with this investment that we're going to call some back. And the, the face of the bond will say that it's callable and it can be called back at the company's request. So the board of directors and the trustees vote for that particular callback. They say, we're gonna call back 5% of our bonds this year. So they call back the bonds, pay back the principal that the individual loaned to the company, plus the interest for that year, and that bond is canceled now. So that's what a callable bond is. Equity securities, come in two different types, generally. Preferred stock and common stock. Preferred stock is where the stockholder enjoys preferences regarding <coughs> assets and dividends. It's very similar to a bond in that there's a required rate of interest or dividends that must be paid annually. Stocks that we call common stocks the company does not have to pay dividends. Microsoft for years withheld dividends so that the value of the stock would grow. But they never paid any dividends. It was just within the last 15 years that they started paying dividends on their stock. So common stock does not have to pay for any dividends, they can retain that income. And that's the accounting classification, retained income. Preferred stock says you have to pay the stockholder a certain percentage of the investment that they made every year. So if it says we'll pay 10% on the value of this stock every year, they value the stock and then pay 10%. That's the dividend on preferred stock. It's a very safe investment. Sometimes these stocks uh, are what we call blue chip stocks, but there are two kinds of blue chip stocks. Blue chip stocks can either be preferred stock where there's guaranteed income paid every year, but it's still stock. Or a blue chip stock can be just from a company that is really well known, has a very, very good reputation, and does very well in business. Like a utility, it's constant. Utilities have constant incomes because the demand for electricity never goes down. The demand for gas never really goes down. So they are like referred to as a blue chip company. And it would be a blue chip stock if you owned it. Preferred stock you don't see very much anymore. It's kind of an old timey thing. Uh, that they were looking not to issue debt, 
they were looking to issue stock, but they wanted to issue bonds, and they said, well, let's come up with a new classification. And that's what they started issuing the preferred stock, and they came up with the rules for that. Common stock, the stockholder owns a portion of the corporation, they're involved with the management, but there aren't any preferences regarding assets or dividends. Absolutely none. Let's talk a minute about corporations, directors, officers, and shareholders. Directors, they do things like vote on issues and decisions. They appoint and supervise officers. They declare and pay corporate dividends or declare that they're not going to pay any corporate dividends. And they manage the corporation. They are the ones who have the buck stopping at their desk kind of thing. Officers, on the other hand, you hear about officers now. Who are officers? They're guys like uh, the president, the vice presidents, uh, the chief financial officer, the chief operating officer, uh, the, the chief legal officer, or the general counsel. They're all in charge of running everything that happens on a day-to-day -day business. They just take care of everything that happens normally. If something is abnormal, it goes to the directors, but officers generally will handle it. And then we have shareholders. Shareholders have very limited duties. What do they do? They elect the board of directors and they approve major board decisions. And that's it. And that's it. Everybody has fiduciary duties inside a corporation. Now we've talked about fiduciary and what fiduciaries are before, okay? But what are fiduciary duties? They are duties to corporations that individuals within a corporation will have to be careful about what they do and how they handle business. They have to be loyal to the corporation. They can't be running around making deals that are going to hurt the corporation. And if there are any duties they have that conflict with other interests or the interests of the corporation, they have to report those and make sure that they're very transparent. So all of the shareholders, not so much, but when we get to corporate officers and when we get to the board of directors, yes, they have to be transparent and they have fiduciary duties to the corporation. So we get into a corporate meeting, into a shareholders meeting. And if you have a uh, organization here on campus where you're going to have a very important decision to make, do you often have a quorum call? You know what a quorum call is? That's when you take account of all your members. You have them actually count off by, by voice. And you call their name and they say, yes, I'm here. So their name is checked off. And a quorum then would be the minimum number of those individuals that you need to be present in order to make some action that you're doing within your organization valid, okay? Especially when it comes to spending or when it comes to hiring new officers or when it comes to replacing directors or something like that. You have to have the appropriate quorum, the appropriate number of people. So that quorum is actually one over half unless the corporation charter specifies a certain number. You can have a super quorum, which is two thirds, which would be one over 66%. But your charter, your rules, your articles of incorporation will all spell that out because the articles of incorporation are your constitution and you have your, your rules and your regulations uh, in your uh, right, right below that in order to, to set that up. 
proxies. What are proxies? Proxies give someone who is a third party the authorization to vote somebody's shares of stock. Every year I get proxies for companies in, in which I own stock. And I'm asked to vote those proxies, which means I'm giving my authorization to vote my shares of stock to someone else. But I read their descriptions and what they believe that's going to happen if this vote goes through. And I vote for the one that comes closest to what I think should happen. That's how I'm governing. But here's the thing. You can go to the shareholders meeting yourself and vote your own shares. You don't have to give your proxy to somebody. And if you ever own uh, enough stock or a stock in a company that has a real good reputation for having good stockholders meetings, you ought to go. Uh, one of the companies that uh, it's really fun to in, be involved in their stockholders meetings is the Disney Corporation. You buy one share of Disney stock, which is suitable for framing. I'll tell you, it's got all the Disney characters on it. It has, it has stock that has all the Disney princesses on it. It has stock that has all the, the old time cartoon characters on it. And then it's got stock that has the new cartoon characters on it. And eventually, I wouldn't be surprised if, because they now own Marvel, if you end up with stock that has Marvel characters on it. So you go to their stockholders meetings and you actually get to interact with all the folks that run Disney and run Marvel and run Fox Entertainment. And, um, Doggone it, you even get to see Mickey Mouse. Because they bring all the characters in. And if you have family, you take the family because the whole family gets to see the characters and do activities. And they hold it at like Disney World or Disneyland in, in uh, California. It just, you know, Anaheim could be a really nice place in the winter. So you take your, your whole family out there for the meeting. A voting trust, a voting trust is an agreement between the stockholders and some trustee in which the, tra the stockholder transfers his legal share titles, kind of like a proxy, to the trustee. Then the trustee is responsible for voting those shares. So we hear a voting trust, that's how it works. It's very similar to a proxy procedure. What's the name of it? What's the difference? The difference is the type of document under which the uh, proxy and the voting trust are set up. A proxy is set up under a regular Articles of Incorporation and a charter for the corporation. So that's, that's over here. A voting trust is set up under a corporation, but it is a trust that holds assets for the benefit of someone else or others or the community. That is where the voting trust comes in. The voting trust then is like the proxy for that voting trust, okay? The business judgment rule is something that we run into a lot when we talk about corporations. The business judgment rule says that officers and directors are not liable for decisions that harm the corporation if they were acting in good faith at the time of the decision and thought they were doing the right thing. That's the business judgment rule. And that business judgment rule exists in law in every state that I'm aware of and the Uniform Corporations Act. Talking about stock a little bit more, you've all probably heard about watered stock, okay? Probably all heard about watered stock. Watered stock is a stock that's issued to individuals at a value that is below fair market value. So if we have 
uh, share of Coca-Cola stock that's selling at $80 today, but we share it with somebody who's paying $40 per share. That stock is watered down stock now. Its value is below fair market value, so it's $40 when the actual value is at 80. Then it also can be stock issued to individuals without expanding the value of previous offerings so that those offerings are going to lose value once the new issue is made. So if we have an $80 stock, and you've heard of stock splitting, if it splits, an $80 stock suddenly, if it's split two for one, becomes a $40 stock. But the company can sell additional shares because whatever they hold in their share bank is now twice what it was before the vote by the board of directors. So that split has allowed them to sell more stock and finance the company even further, but unfortunately, it's reduced the value. Terminology for officers, shareholders, and other relevant individuals. Par value shares. Par value shares are fixed face value noted on the stock certificate. Every stock certificate has a par value. Every stock must have a par value below which it cannot be sold. So if it's noted as a $5 par value stock, the stock cannot be sold below $5. This can be a distinct disadvantage. Most stocks are, are listed as $1 par value. They're listed at $1 par value because if you put a stock up at $5 par value and the company starts to go under, people would say, I'd buy those shares if they were a dollar and you'd be able to continue doing business. But par value makes it impossible to do that. Now, no par shares are stocks without par value. They just say right on the face, printed, no par value. And they can be sold for anything, even if it's a dime. Stock subscription agreements, that's what the, the promoters sell in order to get people interested in buying shares of stock. It contractually obligates the individual to buy shares in the corporation once it becomes a corporation. And then preemptive rights. Preemptive rights are preference that's given to existing shareholders to purchase new stock if a new issue comes out. So preemptive rights say that if you have, say, a 20% value of stock, 20% share of the stock, then you are eligible for the new issue in an amount of 20%. So what we're doing is we're giving a preference to individuals that are already stockholders in proportion to the percentage of stock that the shareholder already owns. You know what dividends are, so I'm not even gonna go through that again. Right of first refusal. A right of first refusal is given to existing shareholders to purchase shares of stock for resale offered by some shareholder in a certain amount of time. Inspection rights. Inspection rights are when the shareholders can go in and inspect the books, and that is protected by the Articles of Incorporation. Stock warrants are vouchers issued to shareholders entitling them to a certain number of shares of stock at a certain price. You'll hear all these again when you go into finance. A shareholder's derivative suit, this is where the shareholders sue the company. So the company is essentially suing itself. And we call that a shareholder's derivative suit. They believe that the corporation has harmed itself. So what they do is they sue the corporation. Again, the corporation ends up suing itself. And whatever the corporation makes out of that, what the shareholders make out of that, stays within the corporation to correct 
whatever value problem there was. Okay, let's see. When does a corporation die? Well, it can die in a couple different ways. It can go out of business, or the court can order it to go out of business. But in those conditions, you do the same thing. You get all of the assets together, just like a partnership. You get all of the assets together, they are valued, they are sold off, they are liquidated, and then the business is dissolved. It's called dissolution. But liquidation is the process by which the trustee takes the corporation's assets, sells them, turns them into cash, and then distributes them among creditors first and shareholders second. Now, creditors also include bondholders. So you have creditors, bondholders, preferred stockholders, and then common stockholders. That's the order in which they're paid. Okay? What's the order? Okay, I'll say it again. Creditors, bondholders, who are also actually creditors, preferred stockholders, and then common stockholders get whatever is left. You can have voluntary dissolution of the business or you can have involuntary dissolution. Voluntary dissolution occurs when the directors of the business say, it's just not working anymore, let's initiate the dissolution process, and they end the business. They wrap up what they're doing, just like we said with partnerships, they wrap up their business, they marshal their assets, and they initiate the dissolution process. Involuntary dissolution is when the state says, you're done, and that's usually done in court, and the state will force it to close. It can happen for tax reasons, it can happen for fraud, it can happen for a number of reasons, but it will be done generally through a court. So some of them, I mentioned, I mentioned the reasons for dissolution were failure to pay taxes. Also, if they don't submit their annual report within 60 days of the due date, or a corporation didn't have a registered agent in the state, you know, it's not their domestic state where they live, but they're operating in the next state over and they don't have a registered agent. A registered agent is somebody who has to receive process. So if they don't have that for more than 60 days, some states require that the business and the corporation dissolve. Corporation can also be dissolved for failure to notify the Secretary of State that its agent has had a change and is someone else now. So there are actually corporations who are registered agent corporations. Does that make sense? If a corporation, their business, is being agent for other corporations. That's their business, that's their product. And then a corporation's duration is always specified in the Articles of Incorporation. If it has no expiration date, then it never expires, it lives on forever. But if it has an expiration date, then the company is thought, told to dissolve because they have reached the point at which they further had no purpose. Courts will look at, at corporations and say, well, you need to dissolve because you obtained your articles of incorporation fraudulently. You weren't really a corporation. You didn't intend to be a corporation. You didn't act like a corporation. Then maybe the corporate directors have abused their powers, so they have committed an ultra vires act. And corporations can become insolvent. So if a corporation files for bankruptcy and cannot meet the terms of the bankruptcy, then it can be dissolved and it can supervise the dissolution and distribution of its assets by the court. Okay? That's all we're going to deal with today. Next time we're going to do corporate finance and we're going to deal with some um, defenses to corporate takeover and mergers.